I assumed that step parenting would be a removed experience. I would feel like an aunt, right? I would feel for them the way I feel for, you know, my nieces, my nephews. And I love the shit out of my nieces and nephews. What did I think was going to happen? Nora McInerney is a really busy mom. I literally, okay, yep. <laughs> I'm still doing this thing. Remember I told you? Yeah, but remember I said, don't come in here and knock on the door. Wait, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Ralph. No, but Ralph, I'm not done talking. Alongside being a best-selling author and hosting the very popular podcast, Terrible Thanks for Asking, Nora has four kids, which means she has to be ready to parent pretty much at all times. For example, right in the middle of her interview for the show. Have, open the cabinet, get a cup out, and then press it against the water dispenser. The cabinet where the cups are in. Ralphie, get your brother a cup, please. Though she always wanted a family, the way she got here was a bit unexpected. Nora met her first husband, Aaron, in 2010. Not long after falling in love, Aaron was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. And while he was receiving treatment, they got married and decided to have a child. Nora gave birth to their son, Ralph, and a little less than two years later, Aaron died. Nora met her second husband, Matthew, through a mutual friend. She thought he would just be a fling, but after a few weeks of dating, it began to feel like something more. Matthew had two kids of his own from a previous marriage. And then, as if things couldn't get more complicated, Nora got pregnant. Today, they have a fully blended family that includes Matthew's kids from his first marriage, Ralph from Nora and Aaron, and the baby that Matthew and Nora had together. It's a lot of happy chaos. Uh, yeah, go play a video game. Okay. <laughs> oh. do, you see his, do you see his lemur eyes? I'm Ashley C. Ford, and this is Going Through It a show about important moments in people's lives and how they navigate them. This season, we're asking how people decide whether or not to become parents. In this episode, we're talking to Nora McInerney about the choice to have a blended family and how creating a family of any kind takes intention, creativity, and letting go of any plans you thought you had. Tell me about meeting Matthew. How did it happen? Where were you emotionally at the time? I have never been in a worse place than I was when I met Matthew. I would have assumed at the time if you asked me, no, 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 my worst point is behind me. It's almost a year after my husband Aaron died. Obviously, that was the lowest point. But I've been sort of kicking the can of my mental and emotional health down the road. My first book, Ashley, has a chapter about how I don't need to go to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, good. Yeah, yeah, totally. That, that's the, the takeaway from the chapter. is like, maybe other people would need help after they watch their husband die in front of their eyes, lose a pregnancy, and their dad drops dead. Not me. Not Nora. Not me. I'm good. I'm literally, I could not be better. I was not better. I was not well. We were approaching, like we were a week or two away from like the one year mark of Aaron's death. And my body was physically like locked up. I couldn't turn my head. I was so unwell. I was so unwell. And my friend Mo, who is one of my best friends, she's also a widow. She had just passed her one year death anniversary. And it was a cold November night, and she asked me to come over to burn things, which I love burning things. It's We're both from the Midwest, right? Like, yep. in the fall, you light a fire. What do you have to uh. burn? Do you have old bills? Do you have credit card statements? Why would you get a shredder? We're drinking wine and sitting around, and a guy comes in the backyard wearing, like, one of those little nylon jackets that— little punk boys used to wear in the 90s and a black hoodie underneath it. It's like 20 degrees. Again, very Midwestern. Yep. <laughs> like, oh, is it winter? <laughs> Not for me. You know, you know, yeah, you know, this woman does need therapy. I also don't need a coat with <laughs> finsulate lining, okay? <laughs> and he came in and I like was like, oh, fine, okay, there's another person here, great. And uh, Mo and I just kept talking and talking. He sits down on one of those 
plastic Adirondack chairs from like Ace Hardware. It had been a little too close to the fire. He sat down and it like buckled <laughs> underneath him. He's like skinny. He weighs nothing. He's right. He's, He's weak. He's small. It's my type. He, <laughs> he, he flips back like his feet fly through the air. And it's like I laughed so hard. Like when you have not laughed in so long that you like – it's church giggles, but then you just break that seal and you're like, and now I can't breathe. Now I'm going to throw up. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to throw up and perish in front of you. And he just like got up, went in her house, cleaned himself up, came back acted like it didn't happen while the whole night I would look at him and be like, like, (laughs) didn't ask him his name, didn't ask him anything about himself, did not care that he was there. And he listened to Mo and I talk about our husbands. He was friends, very good friends with Mo's husband. He didn't know me. He didn't know Aaron. And at the end of the night, I was like, oh, what's your deal? Like, when did your wife die? And he was like, oh, (laughs) no, that's not why I'm here. I'm just (laughs) Mo's friend. (laughs) But Mo had been trying to like get me to, I did not want to date anyone at all, Ashley. I did not want to fall in love. I was like, I already did it and I did it really well. I really did. I was like, it was enough. It was enough. If I never fell in love again, it would have been enough. But I was like, I could have sex with this man. I know I could. So I'm going to get his name and I'm going to find him and I'm going to make him take me out to dinner and I'm going to never call him again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the best and, laid plans and here we are <laughs> and now you have four kids and now we have four kids so yes. you know now we have now we have a mortgage when did you learn that he had kids oh right away right away like when i asked him about himself he was like oh no you know i'm divorced and you know i have a i have a teenager and i have a tween and i was like i'm sorry you said divorce i was so fascinated by that because it is such a different kind of pain. And I like looked at him, I was like, you've been through something. Like that's, there's more to that story. There is more to that story, which is not my story. Okay, so he tells you immediately he has kids. How soon do you start spending time with his kids? It took us, and this is on the fast side, it took us six weeks. When I met Matthew's kids, he brought them over and it was basically pitched like, You know, this is like one of my friends. Think about how many of your parents' friends you meet as a kid. I was always going, right? And you're like, I don't know who this person is, and I don't care. They're a grown-up. And we did not touch each other. It was around Christmas. We made Christmas cookies. And his kids, like, immediately walked in. My child was two years old at the time. And we make the cookies, and they're, like, holding my little toddler. And then they're asking if we can watch a movie. And I had this house at the time that I called the dollhouse. And it was really cozy. And they went upstairs to use the bathroom and were like, there's two beds. Should we stay over here? Like, all this to say, (laughs) six weeks could be really soon to meet somebody. I also think when your kids are a certain age, it would feel weirder to me as a child to meet someone after six months or nine months or 12 months and be like, I'm sorry, you had a whole nother life with right. this person when <laughs> right. I was gone. And now I'm supposed to just like, it felt like a way to on-ramp. And one of the rules that we had is like, I will never encroach on your time with your kids ever unless it is by their request. And you cannot pitch it to them ever. You can never say like, so would you want to hang out with Nora and make me happy? Or should it just be us three? Like you never say my name if they bring it up then we can hang out together. But otherwise, like, their time with you is their time with you. So that's how it happened. And it really did, it did, they all, like, clicked together really quickly. And we clicked together as, like, a little unit of five really quickly, too. You know? Like, they were like, do you want to come to my soccer game? Do you want to come to my concert? Do you want to do this? Like, could we bring Ralph to, like, the giant warehouses filled with trampolines that are, you know? Oh, yeah, Sky Zone, baby. Sky Zone, yes. Sky Zone. How top of mind was the idea of becoming a step parent as you were dating? None. None. <laughs> None. None top of mind. None, None top of mind. <laughs> Not on my mind whatsoever. If I would have found Matthew on an app, I would have said no. For real? You think so? I would so? have said no. I really would have. I really would have won. I did not want to be a stepmom. I did not ever imagine myself being a stepmom. I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in a Catholic community. Like, I did not know any divorced people. I didn't know anyone who had step parents. All of my ideas of step parents came from pop culture, came from movies, came from the parent trap. 
yeah, it's like all you know is like the kids will hate you. And statistically, which I did not know until this year, I did not know. Statistically, second marriages where both parties have kids are more likely to end in divorce. I've heard this. I had never heard that. If somebody would have told me that, I don't know what I would have. I, then I definitely would not have even dated him. But I I had no idea. I had no idea. And now I'm so much more impressed with us. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, whoa. I'm like, wow, look at us. Look at us. One kid in college. We're doing it. One in kindergarten. We're doing it. We are doing great. Yeah. Was there a moment when you realized you were going to have to fully commit to this new blended family thing? I definitely remember a moment where Ian, who's the oldest, he was in eighth grade at this point. And I remember taking Ralph to one of Ian's soccer games. The minute the game was over, he like came over to the stands to grab Ralph, put him on his hip and take him out to the field. And he was saying to everyone like, oh, this is my little brother. You should meet my little brother. And I was like, oh, like it is really serious for them. Yeah. And when they started asking things like, do you think we can all live together? Do you think we could live in this house? Do you think like, do you want to marry my dad? Do you think you want to? Like that kind of stuff. I was like, we have to either not do this at all or do this. But also a part of me, Ashley, was just like, oh, I just get it. You know, there wasn't a part of me where I was like, oh, I don't know if this will work. Like, it just seemed so normal. It seemed so normal for something I had never experienced and never seen happen in my own family. Well, I mean, you already made some really non-traditional decisions about parenthood. Like, you chose to have Ralph knowing Aaron had brain cancer and that you would probably be a single parent. So I wonder if going through that experience maybe prepared you to enter another kind of unconventional family. Yeah, it felt, I think that's such a good observation because it did feel really similar, which is everything's always been unusual anyways. Ralph was a science baby, okay? He required medical intervention. Aaron was radioactive. He had radiation. He was on this crazy chemo where we had to keep our toothbrushes separate, like where we couldn't drink out of the same cups. We had to do, you know, we would have done IVF if we had money. Instead, we did intrauterine insemination, which after I was like, do you guys have like a free version where like he gives you the sperm, you prepare it, and then I just get it in. <laughs> and they're right. like, oh, yeah, it's the percentage is pretty low. But when Aaron was diagnosed, I remember we went to Disney World with his sister and her children. And it was like leaving Disney World with two screaming children, getting on a bus with other screaming children. I was like, don't you want to do this? Like, we should, let's do this. You know, let's do this. Like, it seems so foolish in so many ways like, I knew cognitively, Aaron has stage four brain cancer. Statistically, he will live five years is a high end. Like, statistically, I will be alone. I did not know what that would mean. Right. And then, once he's gone, you're starting to really understand what that means. And then you meet Matthew. Yeah. I did not think that I would end up with four children by falling in love with a man who had two and having him knock me up with a fourth. <laughs> that was not the that was that was not the plan. That was not the plan. I think it kind of reinforces for me that planning is overrated. And I don't want to minimize, you know, what it means to step into a kid's life or to create a life. I'm not doing that, but like there would have been no way to plan this. And I don't think that anything I would have planned would have happened. <laughs> I don't think it would have happened. I don't think it would have happened. We'll be right back. Can you think of a moment where the decision to have new kids in your life really hit home because it's like up until this point, it's just you and Ralph. And you and Ralph are going from you and Ralph to <laughs> you and Ralph and, and, and everybody else. 
it all sounds crazy. It all sounds crazy because when you're dating a parent, like your future to me, like your future with this parent depends on those kids. It really yes. does. Like those kids have to be a part of it. Like I loved Matthew. I would never, ever, ever impose myself on kids who would want their dad to themselves right. or wanted a different kind of life. I just wouldn't. I assumed that step parenting would be a removed experience, right? I would love Ralph. Matthew would love his kids. And we would all be really like sweet to each other. I would feel like an aunt, right? I would feel for them the way I feel for, you know, my nieces, my nephews. And I love the shit out of my nieces and nephews. What did I think was going to happen? <laughs> You know, what did I think was going to happen? Like, I loved Matthew more deeply seeing him as a parent. Like, that first day, I had a house that was built for myself and a child. <laughs> One child. And we're all trying to watch a movie. It's I have a small couch. And they're in, like, a chair. Like, they both, like, an eighth grader and a fourth grader want to, like, snuggle their dad and watch a movie. You know? And I was like, oh, oh. Like, I love them. I love all of you. Like, I don't know. I just fell in love with the whole package. And now I truly, I can't imagine not having what we have. Yeah. One of the things that I've always thought could be, could end up being touchy, could end up being an issue, you see it work for some people, you see it not work for other people, is watching your child who you have raised up into this point be raised by someone else. What's it been like watching Matthew parent Ralph? One thing that I love about Matthew is he's really, really respectful and thoughtful about who Aaron was. There was this guitar of Aaron's that was in storage that Matthew got out and had tuned so that it could be ready for Ralph when Ralph wanted it. And there was a design slash coding camp that he found because Aaron was a digital designer, graphic designer, and he thought maybe Ralph would want to try that too. Oh my God. And so he's really conscious of that. He's really conscious of that. And I, I think parenting any one of these four, we have like oh, this combination of kids, right, that are like biologically has biologically mine, then one that is biologically ours. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what kid it is. Raising, so, raising any kind of kid with another person is so interesting because you're each bringing in your own family stuff into it, your own childhood, your own ego, your own projection over what this like means or looks like. So much of parenting is trying to like, dissolve your own ego. I think that's the that's the hardest part of parenting is there will be something that's like super, super important to one person and you're like, what? Why? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, like, why? He's like, they've got to do their homework, like sitting at this table. I was like, I, look at how I'm sitting in this chair. I was like, I can't sit. I can't sit at a table with my feet on the ground. So if they want to lay on their bellies and do their homework, okay. <laughs> Did the like, homework get done? Great. Great. But what's really important to Matthew is like also being a consistent person. And it's not okay that I was six minutes late to early pickup today, but I was. And I sprinted there, and both of them were standing there as though other parents were not streaming in still. Um, <laughs> I was on the early side of late, but Matthew would never be late. Matthew would be there eight minutes early. He would be the first parent there because he would never want the kids to wonder at all. And so he's had to. He said, be patient with me about stuff. And again, marriage is so much compromise. Being in a relationship is so much compromise. Your job, jobs, the umbrella, you know, of things that you do, that you make, that you put out into the world, so much of it has to do with grief, your grief, other people's grief, like you don't hide from that part of life, which is beautiful and, and, and wonderful and terrifying in its own way. But how has that informed the way you parent? I think the trick is to not get yours on them, but have mm. the capacity to absorb theirs. Oh, man. Because I never saw my parents grieve. And so I thought that it was just me. 
And that if I was still sad after a funeral, months, years, if I still cried about my grandpa or my uncle, that I was like defective or, you know, ill. <laughs> um, right. And I recognized immediately the older kids as, as kids carrying grief, as kids who are grieving and wanted to and still do treat that with a lot of respect. I think there are things that the older kids have been able to share with me that they haven't shared with Matthew, not because he's not a wonderful dad, but because they have to consider his feelings, right? Or like, or you're just biologically wired to, right? To like right. not want your dad to worry or to not let him know that this thing that happened that he was a part of like hurt in some way. You don't want to do have to do that emotional caretaking for a parent and they don't have to do it for me because I wasn't there and I'm a third party, you know? It's like, and I didn't have a grown up like that. It's like, I'm not their mom. I'm not their dad. I'm a parent. I can be that place for them. And I'm really glad to be that place for them. I have one more question for you because I think this just puts together so much of what we've been talking about the entire time. But, you know, you have a family full of kids who have experienced big, big emotions earlier in life than we would expect. Not that it's necessarily uncommon, but it is certainly earlier in life than we would expect for kids to have to grapple with some of these big concepts, big ideas, big, big complex feelings. How do you see this playing out over time? Oh, I, I wish I had a crystal ball. Um <laughs> It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. But at least the thing that we have now that we didn't have when I, at least in the 90s I experienced is like we do care about kids' feelings now and we can recognize that kids have them and they have help with their feelings, not just from me. And so I hope, I hope, I hope, especially with three white boys mm -hmm. that I am in the process of creating emotionally functional adult men who do not use what they've been through as an excuse to treat other people poorly, who can deal with these feelings, who can handle somebody else's feelings. And uh, yeah, that is my biggest hope. That's my biggest hope. And also that all of them know that they have a safe home inside of themselves and inside of this family. That is the most important thing to me. And I think you've done it, right? Like, you're so. going to keep so. doing so. it. Yeah. We're going to keep doing it. We're going to keep doing it. We called last night's dinner uh, uh, Mama's Boys Thursdays. <laughs> That's what I'm talking so about. We're gonna, and Ian has told me he is available on Thursdays. And I did the thing that every kid needs when they're in college. I ordered him two entrees and an appetizer so he could box them up and bring them home. There you okay. go. Okay. That, super yeah. mom. Super mom. <laughs> Don't put no step in it. Uh. One of my biggest hesitations about parenthood is a desire to maintain control in my life. But Nora's experience makes me question not only my need for that control, but if I ever had as much control over my life as I thought I did in the first place. Death just happens. Falling in love just happens. Sometimes having kids just happens. We so rarely get to choose the details of their occurrence. The fact that our lives, through no direct influence of our own, can dramatically shift in an instant is terrifying and inspirational at the same time. Life has surprised Nora over and over again as a parent, as a partner, and as a person. And as much as I want to make all the right decisions, I don't want to deny myself what life might surprise me with if I just do a little more letting go. Going Through It is a production of Pineapple Street Studios and MailChimp. Our producer is Emerald O'Brien. Our associate producers are Marina Hankey and Yinka Rickford Anguin. Our managing producer is Camila Kashani. The show is edited by Aaron Edwards. Mixing by Davy Sumner. 
Original music by Mike Noyce and Davy Sumner with additional music from Epidemic Sound. Mara Davis is our booker. We had help from Stephen Key, Jason Richards, and Ari Saperstein. Legal services for Pineapple Street by Bianca Grimshaw at Granderson de Roche. Our executive producer is J.N. Barry. Our production partners at MailChimp Studios are Julie Douglas, Sasha Brown, Christina Humphrey, and Caroline Albro. And a special thanks to my better half, without whom none of this would be possible. My assistant, Ariane Young. And thank you for listening. We know the range of experiences around this decision is so broad. And while we can't cover every story, we're grateful that we could bring you a few of them. 